People who are getting released from prison have so many things they have to deal with. Sometimes it's like you wear it like an invisible coat, you know. You feel it and you, and you wonder if anybody else can see it. There is a punishment that people endure long, long after the sentence is over. And it feels like you're never going to be whole again. You're never going to be a, a person and you're not worthy of a place in society. And that kind of defeats the purpose of being released. I would like to think that higher education can play a very critical role, a critically important role for people coming out of prison. Also, that this is a role we haven't yet explored adequately. Today, we have found mechanisms to filter out those who, because of their prison experience, might be most desiring of changing their lives and of quality education. And that's a tragedy, but it's one that we can fix. Initially, as we did re-entry work, it was primarily focused on the barriers to employment. About five years ago, an area caught our attention that had literally gone unnoticed, unwritten about. One of the local community colleges in upstate New York that we had been referring students to had created an absolute bar to admissions to the effect that if you have a felony conviction, you need not apply. Quite frankly, I, I doubted that that could be true. Um, and, and I said, well, I'd like to see the policy. And sure enough, they came back to me with a, a written policy. And, and it was the, the first time that, that my eyes were open to the fact that there may be this much larger problem. It led us to look at the policies around New York State and then nationwide. What we found was that about 60% of all colleges engage in some sort of screening, sometimes with very little training. And it began us on this path of it, asking a lot of questions about what is this about? Could it really be about public safety and campus safety? Um, or were these counterproductive policies as we suspected? I was incarcerated for 16 years, and in that time I was able to obtain my associate's degree from an in-college program. Well, I went in as an 18-year-old, and you could say like my mind was like, you know, a 16-year-old. I just was not fully mature, even though I, I thought I was. I went to prison when I was 16, so I never had a chance to graduate from high school. But I was always interested in archaeology. I got locked up on a Friday night. I was released on Monday morning. That was enough of a prison sentence for me. And I remember my mother telling me, son, you have a good head on your shoulders, you have a good head on your shoulders. So I used to like, ponder, if that's the case, how did I get here? Because I experienced in the criminal justice system a lack of ability to operate or to deal with my lawyers because my education level was so low that I couldn't even help myself because I was innocently incarcerated for 25 years. You know, and so I saw that education, it was like mandatory. I've always wanted to go to law school since I was in my early 20s, maybe like 21, 22 years old. And I finished my associates while I was out on bail. And from a standpoint of having been through what I've been through, having been in an abusive relationship and have gone to prison for it, ultimately, I remain interested in the law despite my own case. And it wasn't until about my six months into my incarceration that there was an older gentleman who approached me and had talked to me about getting involved in, a, in, a youth, in the youth assistance program. I said, I don't really know, I just came upstate. And he said, you know what, I understand you want to think about it, but this is what you really have to think about. Do you want to be part of the problem or do you want to be part of the solution? And he left it just like that and walked away. And it was that question that literally changed my life. I started with my GED and I attained that. And once I attained my GED, I was like, wow. And I stuck toothpaste to the back of the GED and put it on my wall, and I couldn't stop looking at it. And once I went to um, the program at Auburn, that was the moment, that was my aha moment, because I felt that I was able to actually do college level work. And it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like an epiphany. I can recall sitting and doing some serious introspection on my life. 
how I had deprecated my community and what I can do differently so that I would be an asset to, to my community once I made the transition. My first challenge was to find a job that was very challenging. Um, a lot of people are not willing to hire ex-felons. Many of us, like we come home, we don't have no birth certificate, we don't have no social security card, we don't have a place to live. Just getting on the bus and knowing how to turn your metro card, you know, you're holding up a line, people behind you, what's wrong with you? I had rejection applying to live in an apartment complex because I had a felony and they do criminal background checks on every tenant. Public housing, if you have a criminal conviction you can't live in public housing. Section 8, if you have a criminal conviction you can't have access to Section 8. Certain types of employment, licensure, certification, there's absolute bars based solely on whether or not a person's been to prison. I guess I kind of knew the reality of my record was tainted. I guess I didn't think it would be as far-reaching as it was. After a few months, and another month passed, and another month passed, and I was just like, oh my God, I'm never gonna find a job. When I got out, I knew that I wanted to pursue business again. You cannot achieve any type of great success without education behind you in this day and age, especially in this economy. I knew that school would be a place for me to um, adjust back to, the, to society in a healthy environment. And all I needed was to get into the school because after that, I was gonna just, you know, put my mind, heart, and soul into my work. I had to fill out the application, of course, and the application required me to check off the box. You have that, the infamous conviction question, and, I mean, who knows how to answer that correctly? That box is, the box. I think that that box is the most damaging box possible in society. When I saw it, it was like, okay, there it is. It's been 29 years. And it took me right back to the officer saying to me, uh, just move over, inmate. As soon as I was arrested, I became an inmate. But there was such a chilling effect to think that I wanted to go to college and here, as I'm on my path to change my life, I'm still being asked these questions. I was told initially by uh, my college mentor of the process that it would be lengthy, that it could be deterring. Even though I was given the heads up that it would be, I was still blown away at all of the things that they asked for. My complete criminal history, authorization forms for release of information, a letter from my parole officer on top of two recommendation letters. I happen to have a parole officer that's great. She was all for writing a letter for me to get back into school. But they're all different. They range from all different aspects. There's some that wouldn't be as willing to help out. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to fill it out. Um, and and I, yeah, that's it. That's it. I'll find some, something, I'll find somewhere else to go. That's what really um, amazed me. Like, I wouldn't think an educational institution would hold that against somebody if they see somebody's trying to improve themselves. It's understandable that people ha who have no exposure to this issue, other than what they see in the media, would be afraid. If you, however, work with and study the, the dynamics that actually occur when formerly incarcerated people enter an institution, you get an entirely different picture. First of all, these are the most motivated students. They have the most to lose and the most to gain. It's ironic that the outward perception uh, would be that this is your population that is not deserving. Uh, that won't take advantage of, of college education when in fact many of those men will be much more likely to be extremely successful as they take individual ownership of that opportunity. We know over time that the, uh, the recidivism rates of people who have records diminishes to the point where it's, you know, they're just like the general population, uh, people age out of crime. What's important for policymakers to understand is that if there is one thing that we know about, particularly about the criminal behavior of teenagers, is that the vast majority will be one-time offenders, one and done. Um, partly because they age out, mature out. What the American Bar Association has had to say about adolescent behavior is important 
that the brain of a young person is different than that of an adult. It leads to higher risk taking, a willingness to follow one's peers rather than some other social restrictions. It is that knowledge that's led our courts, and more recently the Supreme Court, um, to tell us that the behavior of teenagers is not predictive of future misconduct. And our officers will be the first to tell you they have not had problems with some of um, you know the, I use the word ex-offenders who have come in. They need to deal with day-to-day -day situations that come up with any campus with college students. You know, young student, 18-year-old who's coming right, right out of high school and is coming onto a residential campus for the first time, well, that's what they're spending their time on. And the fact is that people who go through the process of getting into college after they come home from prison have shifted identity and have extremely low recidivism rates and higher graduation rates than their peers. The truth is that the person who chooses to enroll in school after incarceration is the least likely person to commit a crime on campus. And we need to educate all school administrators about that. If the driving force were to make our campuses safer by screening out certain students, perhaps a modest proposal that, that they might consider would be that, that perhaps we should only admit women to our colleges and universities since their male counterparts offend at three times the rate that they do. Now we wouldn't, of course, adopt that as a policy, but it does make one re-examine, is the goal simply to make college campuses safer or do we need to look at the context in which this is happening? As we think about people with criminal records, often uh, folks in their minds think that this is some very small segment of the population, but the truth is that while the United States is only 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's prison population. There are over 100 million records on file with criminal justice repositories around the country. The big trend that we should keep in mind is that starting 1972, we have quadrupled the per capita rate of incarceration. Unprecedented in the history of uh, the human race, unprecedented in our own national history. Now that phenomenon is not equally distributed across the country. It has fallen most harshly on communities of color and is driven a lot by the increase in drug arrests. We now know since the 1990s with federal survey data that blacks and whites and others consume drugs at roughly the same rates based on their uh, proportion of the population. And yet, in states across the country, those who have been convicted of nonviolent drug offenses are, have been black and brown at rates of 80 to 90 percent of prison admissions. This is roughly described as the onset of the war on drugs, a moment that really intensified and exacerbated existing practices that included the disproportionate focus on policing black communities, what we call stop and frisk, and discriminatory enforcement. A African American male today has a one in three lifetime chance of spending at least one year in prison. This just cuts across everything we're trying to do uh, as a society in terms of promoting uh, democracy, pursuing racial justice, uh, trying to help people get out of poverty and into the middle class. Any policy that's based solely on having a felony conviction, unfortunately, is going to disproportionately uh, impact people of color and low-income communities of color. And many of the colleges are actually charged with targeting these communities to help them get access to higher education. If our public institutions are, are going to fulfill their mission, they have to consider that the large majority of people who are impacted by our criminal justice system are the very people that they have a mission to serve. And unless they make that connection, they're going to miss the mark in achieving their very own missions. What's often overlooked is the profound benefit that higher education institutions, their students, and their faculty receive when formerly incarcerated people enter an institution. There's a big benefit uh, to us to have people on our campus and our classrooms participating in our discussions who bring into those discussions the personal experience uh, of having been incarcerated. These are the students who, given the support that every first-generation college student needs, who excel not only in their academics, 
but also, and most importantly, in what they do when they leave. People who come into college from an experience of prison disproportionately participate in human services, community development, leadership, and public problem-solving fields. Unfortunately, you committed a crime, and you know it's it's something that's going to stay with you forever. You know you can't erase it, especially when it's something serious. You know. Um, however, how can I use that in a positive way? Many of these social organizations right now are hiring individuals just like myself who have transformed their life, who have gained an education. A lot of people who are formerly incarcerated that go on to be in human services have a deep sense of this is not enough. Okay, so I'm working as a case manager and I'm assisting people, but that's not enough. I'm a mentor for college initiative, but that's not enough. And I'm going for my case, and that's not enough because I owe this to myself. I owe it to my family. I have an understanding of what my, what my role and position is in society. I think admissions officers and counselors and faculty and student groups uh, and the like, that, there's, that we need an education of the education community to think about this particular population. To bar people from access to education, access to higher education, is, you know, really fear-driven, unfortunately, um, not based on any sort of uh, research or risk assessment. For me, in an ideal world, um, the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime, would not be an appropriate question to have on an application to college. Since there is no empirical evidence anywhere to support the notion that campus safety was improved by this screening process, the first and foremost of our recommendations would be that the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime, would be removed from the initial application completely. The second of our recommendations was that if a school is going to do this, they really need to do it in a transparent way. They need to train their staff and they need to let applicants know exactly what the process is. Education represents life to me. It represents growth and development. It represents a free mind. We're not playing. We're not, I didn't suffer all those years to come out here to waste it and, and to give, it, give my freedom away. I went to school in the summer, I went to school in the winter. If they had another season, I would have been going to school during that season. I can't catch up. I can't get back the 15 years that I lost while I was in prison. My mother got the opportunity to see me graduate with my associates. One of the best things for me seeing was that she was at peace, you know? She didn't have to worry about her son no more. If you just pause and think about the emergence of mass incarceration and the war on drugs and the collateral damage that now we simply throw away people who have served their time. It's an outrage. In the same way that we look back comfortably with the distance of time and say slavery was a moral evil, it's a stain on the American story. I didn't have anything to do with it. Future observers of our time will look back on this moment and say, it's a shame what we allow to happen. And we all bear responsibility for that.